Good morning. Good morning. It's good to be face to face, isn't it? Yeah. Well, God bless you, the faithful that are here. That's wonderful. Um, I hope that this message reaches those who were unable to attend today and uh, those that um, uh, are, are kind of locked in or are there because of COVID-19. I would really like to uh, just say a blessing on everybody this morning here. And so let's start off with some prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to get together into fellowship once again. I ask God for each person that's here that you keep them in safeguard, Lord, that, that this viral pandemic, Lord, will not touch them in any way, shape, or form. I ask God that you will just bless them, Lord. We are doing what we can in terms of safety, God, but we know that you are the great physician and you keep us in the palm of your hand and you take care of us. And so this morning, God, I'm just asking for a special blessing and protection over those that have come out this morning. And for those that have stayed home, Lord, I ask for another special blessing of protection, Lord, because as we go about shopping and doing the things that we need to do, we can be exposed to these things. And Lord, we just know, Lord, that your host can, can watch over us. And so we thank you for that. And we praise your name, Jesus. I ask God that uh, what we do today, this, this sermon, will minister to each and every person who hears it. And I ask God that the words will quicken, lift up, and edify the hearts, God. In your mighty, precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks everybody for being here this morning. It's wonderful to see you, like I said, face to face. It's been about three and a half months. No. Yeah, more than that even. But, but I, I reckon in about three and a half months since we've got together. And uh, it's really nice to see you. Um, I'm going to start off the sermon I had today. Uh, I'll be honest with you, was a little harsh and I took a little bit of hit on it. And the Lord had said that, uh, you know, that's just my frustration coming out. And so we retooled. And what I have for you, based upon what the Lord has approved, is a sermon called, uh, Are You Committed? Or consecrated okay and um, the first question I have this morning is do you need to be committed have your friends ever told you that you need to be committed have people ever with white coats ever come to you and given you a jacket that ties in the back no, I'm just kidding um, let me start off with this uh, this story in April 1985 at the Good News Broadcaster it's from uh, page 12. A missionary society wrote to David Livingston, you know, Dr. Livingston, I presume. And he says, have you found a good road to where you are? If so, we want to know how to send other men to join you. Livingston wrote back, if you have men who will come only if they know there's a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come if there's no road at all. Okay? We have a God-given vision for this church. Now, we need visionary leaders to take a hold of it and to do what it takes to make it happen. Now, I appreciate each and every person here. And you know what? One of the things that I've found is that we need to reach out to our friends. We need to reach out to people. We need to encourage them to come. There are situations where it's difficult sometimes to get there, where you know, witnessing is difficult, but every single one of us can simply ask, hey, would you like to come? It's not our responsibility uh, to make them come here. That's their choice. What is our responsibility is to give them an invitation. Sure. Okay? Um, now, a lot of you know about being consecrated unto the Lord. As a minister of the gospel, my life has been set aside and has been consecrated to him. Each of us Christians need to take the step of consecrating our lives to the Lord. Now, I've been asked in the past, what does consecrated mean? Because it seems kind of like an old word, it's old timey, it seems kind of a little bit scary, and, and some might even say cultish based upon some of the, the movies and stuff we see coming out of Hollywood. You know, usually they use consecrated in the, in the words of, you know, blood sacrifices and things like that. And the truth is that they're not that far off, but they're wrong in their application. Uh, dictionary definitions to describe it I've used, but I came across an excellent example that explains consecrated so well. It's really being set aside. 
A woman approaches her pastor and asks him, what is your idea of what consecration means? I really want to understand it. And I think this is a great illustration because all of us can now um, understand what this means when we go through this. Consecration is to sign the bottom of a blank piece of paper as a covenant between you and God. You get that? A blank piece of paper. The woman said, but there's nothing on the sheet. And he says, that's consecration to trust God completely with your life and let him fill in the sheet as he wills. Okay? So many in our churches today hand over only a portion of their lives to God. Or they will try to set up boundaries between themselves and their commitment to Christ. Uh, to see God move powerfully in your life, you need to allow Him to write your story within you. Right? Think of that like that blank sheet of paper. God, I trust you with my life and I'm going to sign the bottom of it. And Lord, have your will. Bring me out to the person that you would have me to be. Okay? Now, our world is in a state where it would be very difficult to be, or when it will be, not yet, sorry, but it is in a state where it is difficult, but it will be even more difficult to be a Christian in our society. Right? There is uh, ostracization, there is prejudice, there is all kinds of things against the Christian belief. If society ostracized you for your faith today, would you still believe and are you grounded in the Word of God? Okay? Principles and ideals have always come at a cost. One famous example of this is in the, just south of the border here, the United States, the United States Declaration of Independence. The first line says, We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, to promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. Now this document was written with the intention and belief of those writing it. Okay? They pledged themselves to an ideal just as we have committed our lives to Christ. Okay? They detailed a progressive vision for the future for their children and their children's children. My Bible tells me that without a progressive vision, the people dwell aimlessly, and in some versions it says the people perish. So, being Canadian, why would I use this in a sermon? Well, because it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're a student of history, you will know that there were 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence. 56. Did you know that their conviction resulted in untold suffering for themselves and their families? You see, whenever a man of principle or a woman of principle stands up for what they believe in, there can be um, opposing forces. And we know that we have an enemy, an adversary. Okay? Um, of those original 56 visionary men, five were captured by the British and tortured before their deaths. Twelve of them had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army. Another had two sons captured, and nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds and the hardships of war. This is not written, but i got to say this. You know, anyone who participates in war, whether they no come back or not, is changed forever. War has huge, huge impacts and huge costs. And, you know, I honor the men and women that we have in our country that stand up for our country. Even the men on the thin blue line, you know, they keep us in domestic tranquility and... and these are laudable and wonderful things that they do for us. 
The Bible says that no greater thing can a man do than lay down his life for his friends, but it, it's, it's amazing. So when I think of these 56 uh, men, they believed in one nation under God. Indivisible, right? Strong. They're standing together. They're stronger together. They know that with liberty, that's our freedoms, and justice for all. There is a, a, a man by the name of Pastor Kyle Eidelman. I don't know if you remember a few years back we did his series, Not a Fan. Mm -hmm. It was a good series, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and basically the gist of it was that God wants committed followers, not just fans. Perhaps some here may be of the mind that they will get better and society as a whole will smooth out. People will no longer be bigoted. Like, look at what's happening right now with, uh, with the, the Black Lives Matter movement in the States and all the, the riots and things that are going on. That grieves my heart. It really grieves my heart that we get to that kind of a state, and in Canada as well. Kindness will return, and things will once again be done in Canada and in the USA, in fact, the world, in a way that's godly. Let me be honest here. My friends, we are literally in the last days of the Lord's return. The signs are coming to pass around us to tell us that the season of the Lord's return will be soon. Now, when somebody comes out and says God will be back on April 22nd, 2021, or they'll say this or that date, they're wrong. The Bible says no man will know the day or the hour except the Father. And so, I don't know where they're coming up with these dates. It just tells me they don't read their word. But we can see, based upon the prophecies of the end times, that we are in those latter days right now. If you have your Bibles with me, um, turn to 2 Timothy 3. We're going to read verses 3 to 15. I'll read them aloud here. Um, here we go. It says this. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You know what? That's not great news. Who feels good about that? But we're supposed to count it all joy. Here's what it says. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So, what do we do? Well, I think the answer to this is if we just step back a couple of verses, or sorry, forward a couple of verses, to uh, 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 to 5. Here's what the Word of God says. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearance and his kingdom. Preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they, meaning people, will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their eyes away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, as someone who spreads the news of Jesus, and fulfill your ministry. See, our freedom has been won at a terrible cost in blood. Once from our Savior to cleanse us from sin and give us eternal life, and other times by brave men and women who have defended our right to worship God freely in this country. I, for one, will be ever, forever grateful. Have you seen the videos on the internet where people, in, where, where in people in countries that are not free, uh, that are receiving Bibles? Have you ever gone on the internet and watched it where they're in communist countries and stuff like that, where the Bible is forbidden and they actually receive them? It, it, it's, a, it's a heartwarming thing. They're hugging them, right? They kiss them, they hold them to their hearts, right? If they're caught with them, they could be killed. Their choice to serve is at the peril of death. 
Their choice to believe in Jesus puts their very selves on the line. These are literally people putting their lines, lives on the line to pursue Jesus. Interestingly, in these countries, we're also seeing tens of thousands of people coming to Jesus and miracles happening. Our website that we had up was hitting, getting 1,200 unique IPs a month, two-thirds of which were from China. It was an amazing thing to see people soaking up the Word of God. Ask yourself this morning, would you risk your life for a Bible? Since you don't have to right now, I ask each person here to consider for themselves a simple question. What am I doing with the opportunity I have been given that's been paid for with the blood of Canada's sons and daughters? We are free in this country. We are free, free indeed. Our lives are not in peril to have a Bible. In fact, I've got several. I've got an archaeology Bible, I've got commentary Bibles, I've got inline Bibles, I've got these things that just teach me more and more about the Word of God, and I just love that. But for us to ever consider the fact that that freedom wasn't paid for, hmm, you know, maybe I should save this sermon for, uh, for Veterans Day or Remembrance Day, but, but the point is, is that people paid for this with their lives. It meant enough to them that we would have the freedoms that they laid down their lives for this. Do you know what I would call that? I would call that commitment. Yes. I would totally call that commitment. You are committed if you're out there fighting for a cause like that. Adorniram Judson sweated out of Burma's heat for 18 years. He didn't have a furlough. Six years, he didn't have a, a convert to the, to the Holy Spirit. And enduring, or to Jesus rather, enduring torture and imprisonment, he admitted that he never saw a ship sail without wanting to jump on board and go home. When his wife's health broke and he put her on a homebound vessel, in the knowledge he would not see her for two full years. He confided to his diary, if we could find some quiet resting place on earth where we could spend the rest of our days in peace. But he steadied himself with this remarkable postscript. Life is short. Millions of Burmese are perishing. I'm almost the only person on earth who has attained their language to communicate salvation. You see, who's ever gone through a dark time of the soul, a time where they've really struggled and they've had, and they've had a hard time? I, I can tell you that I have, honestly. There's been situations in my life where I've had to go, Lord, I don't understand. This is just beyond my ability to cope with. But we have to rally, we have to pick ourselves up, and we have to say, I am committed to following Jesus. It's easy when all our freedoms are here. It's easy when we can just get up and go to church on Sunday morning. It's easy when there's no persecution. It's easy during those times. But when times are tough, when we're struggling, when we're hurting, when things are going on in our lives that are bringing us down, when there's trials, there's tribulations, there's struggles, there's a pandemic... What do we do? Well, we can start going down into that well, or we can pick ourselves up, and we can say, Jesus, I need you. You said you'd never let me walk this alone. You said you'd never leave me or forsake me. You won't give me more than I can handle, Lord, so I'm asking you right now, Jesus, to come and lift me up and to be with me. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you felt like at the bottom of that hole. I am. I'll tell you, it's, uh, it's not pleasant. And the thing that we need to remember is that Jesus is there for us. One of the hard things about not being able to get together for the last three and a half months or so forth is I miss the strength of the friends and the Christians that I get with that lift up and encourage. Who's with me? That's hard, isn't it? 
Yeah. Uh, praise God that you guys are here. Thank you, Jesus. I, I, I thank you because you're such a blessing. Have we as a society become apathetic to those souls that are being lost forever? There are people that, people that are dying out there that are never going to uh, come to heaven. Everyone will live forever. It's just where they're going to spend eternity. And I don't know about you, but that really bothers my heart. I want to take... Well, I don't want to say that because it sounds bad, but when I go to heaven, right, and others go at their time, I want as many to join me in heaven as possible. That's right. Right? So I think that's a wonderful thing. I don't want... God tarries because he wants all that, uh, that will come to come to him. When we think of Judson's story, can we see his discouragement and yet his focus and his commitment to his mission. What about our kids? I know I'm committed to my kids. I love my kids. I've done everything I can for them. I help them. You know, but kids. Let's look at a football team versus a youth group in the church. I've often wondered what would happen if football coaches approach their work like most youth ministers are expected to. For example, I wonder what would happen if when a player was too busy to show up for practice, the understanding coach simply said, we'll miss you, I hope you'll be able to make it next week sometime. Imagine the players leaving practice and hearing the coach say, thanks for coming, I hope you'll come back tomorrow. If a football team operated like a typical youth ministry, we might expect concerned parents to call the coach saying, can you tell me what's going on in practice? My son says it's boring and he doesn't want to come anymore. I was wondering, could you make it a little bit more fun for them? And by the way, you might want to talk to the coach at the school across town because he seems to have the right idea. Coach might send out quarterly questionnaires about what the players would like to change about the team. I can just imagine the answers. We want shorter practices. We want more winning. Sort of like diametrically opposed objectives in my mind, but you know. A coach responding like a typical youth leader might first feel guilty that the practices were not meeting the needs of the boys. And he would try to adjust his program to suit the boys and every other boy who complained. Between trying to keep everybody happy and giving every student a good experience, the coach would squeeze in a little bit of football practice. And what kind of season would this coach have? Hmm. It's a safe bet that the coach wouldn't be the one who felt like a loser but this is the very way that most churches expect to run their youth ministries. We have a need to call for commitment. To expect the youth to be committed to the church at the same level of commitment that would be expected on an athletic team would draw the charge of you're being too legal and of Religious individualism that the expectation of commitment to the church has become implausible to most Christian parents. Because the God of individualism, individualism pressures us to program to the lowest common denominator, we seldom rise the expectations high enough for teenagers to experience that real community that they need. Real community means real responsibility for each other. It means a commitment to be there for each other even when the schedule is tight and when motivations is low. Are low, sorry. But the typical Christian adult in our culture knows little about commitment to community. Now, present company excluded, of course, but there is a problem. See, our church says that we embrace community. We can't take them to the highway 
or sorry, we can't let them take the highway to hell without at least trying, can we? No. no. I love what John Wesley said. It is powerful. Give me ten men who hate nothing but sin. These are obviously not internet bloggers, just for the record. Who hate nothing but sin and love God with all their hearts and I will shake the world for Christ. Do you know what Ray Green said? He said, give me ten men who hate nothing but sin and love God with all their hearts and I will shake Selma, Trail, Rosalind, British Columbia, Canada, and the world for Christ. Great men have been afraid of the unknown, but we've had the courage to move forward anyway. Take, for example, Hernando Cortez. Yes, this is turning into a history lesson today. <laughs> Hernando Cortez, in 1519, he landed at Veracruz, Mexico. His goal was conquest. Either he was afraid of his own determination, or he was concerned over the lack of commitment uh, to the cause by his men. Anybody know why? Anybody know what he did? He landed at Veracruz, Mexico, and he immediately set fire to his 11th ship armada. He believed that with no means of retreat, his army had only one direction to go, into the interior of Mexico. And Cortez saw there was a price to pay for his commitment, and he paid it. The Word of God says in Luke 9, 62b, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. When committed to Christ, don't look back. Plow the furrow straight. We are committed to doing what God says. Folks, God doesn't look back at our past, nor does he remember our sin. Why should we? We need to move forward with God. We need to commit to moving forward with a unified vision. What is the vision of the church? Well, we worship God. We love all people. Believe it or not, that statement is huge in terms of scope. And we embrace our community. That's what a progressive vision is. We're moving it forward. We want to grow the church. We want to grow the people. We want to help the areas where people are struggling in our communities. We want to bring them the good news of Jesus. One of my favorite Christian authors is a man by the name of Max Lucado. Has anybody ever read any of his stuff? Okay. Uh, anyway, in his book, The Eye of the Storm, he relates a story of commitment and courage that I'll share with you. Try to look for the commitment in this narrative. February 15th, 1921, New York City. I was but a wee lad. <laughs> <laughs> the operating room of the Kane Summit Hospital. A doctor's performing an appendectomy. Okay, that's where they take your appendix out. In many ways, the events leading to the surgery are uneventful. The patient has complained of severe abdominal pain. The diagnosis is clear. It's an inflamed appendix. Dr. Evan O'Neill Kane is performing the surgery. In his distinguished 37-year medical career, he has performed nearly 40, or sorry, nearly 4,000 appendectomies. 4,000 of these operations he's performed. So I would call him pretty skilled and pretty experienced. So the surgery will be uneventful in all the ways except for two. The first novelty of this operation, the use of local anesthesia in major surgery. So he's not getting put out, he's just using a local. Now Dr. Kane was a crusader against the hazards of general anesthesia. He contends that a local application is far safer. And he believed in it. He was committed to this idea. 
Many of his colleagues agreed with him in principle, but in order for them to agree in practice, they will have to see the theory applied. Dr. Kane searches for a volunteer, a patient who's willing to undergo surgery while under local anesthesia. A volunteer is not easily found. Many are squeamish at the thought of being awake during their own surgery. Who else would be squeamish being awake during their surgery? Yeah, I'm sorry, but that's a hard one for me. I don't know. I'd rather just go to sleep and wake up, everything's fixed. Yeah. Right? That's right. So, others are fearful that the anesthesia might wear off too soon. Eventually, however, Dr. Fine, Kane finds a candidate. On Tuesday morning, February 15th, the historic operation occurs. The patient is prepped and wheeled into the operating room. A local anesthetic is applied as he has done thousands of times. Dr. Kane dissects the superficial tissue and locates the appendix. He skillfully excises it and concludes the surgery. During the procedure, the patient complains of only minor discomfort. The volunteer is taken into post-op and then placed in a hospital ward. He recovers quickly and is dismissed two days later. Dr. Kane had proven his theory. Thanks to the willingness of a brave volunteer, Kane demonstrated that local anesthesia was viable and even a preferable alternative. But if you remember closely, I said that there were two facts that made this surgery unique. I told you the first, the use of local anesthesia. The second is the patient. The courageous candidate for the surgery was Dr. Kane. So the surgery was performed by Dr. Kane on Dr. Kane. You have to be pretty committed to a belief in something if you're going to try something like that. To prove his point, Dr. Kane operated on himself. Not me, man. But <laughs> you get it, right? A wise move. The doctor became a patient in order to convince the patients to trust the doctor. Sometimes commitment to mission is not only required of others, but of ourselves. I think I'm on a quote roll this morning. So let me continue with the world-renowned tenor, Luciano Pavarotti. This is what he said. When I, oh, sorry. When I was a boy, <laughs> my father, a baker, introduced me to the wonders of song. He urged me to work very hard to develop my voice. Arrigo Pola, a professor tenor in my hometown of Modena, Italy, took me as a pupil. I also enrolled in a teacher's college. On graduating, I asked my father, shall I be a teacher or a singer? Luciano, my father replied, if you try to sit on two chairs, you will fall between them. For life, you must choose one chair. I chose one. It took seven years of study and frustration before I made my first professional appearance. And it took seven years to reach the Melic Metropolitan Opera. And now I think, whether it's laying bricks, writing a book, whatever we choose, we should give ourselves to it. Commitment, that's the key. Choose one chair. Does that mean we can't do other things? No. What it means is, is that we have to keep our focus focused. James 1.8 tells us that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, double-minded can uh, be confusing, so I wanted to make sure I had this in the exact right context of two minds, right? But double-minded actually in the, composite, in the uh, commentary means two-souled. A two-souled man wavers and is uncertain about God. He partly believes and partly disbelieves God. He debates whether he can trust God. This packed person lacks certainty because he is a man of no fixed or decided purpose. Is your heart with God or is it with the world? We need to make a choice. 
This double-minded man is a person of verses 5 to 7 who lacks wisdom but does not ask God for it in belief. His prayer life is like a raging sea and tossed by the wind. A two-souled person is inconsistent, unstable, and unsettled. His belief is like a drunk, a belief that staggers down the road of life. People whose faith falters with the ebb and flow of life do not have God's respect because they divide their loyalty between God and other things. It is usually pressure that causes them to crumble. Doubt blunts faith. We need to receive from God. This creates a chaotic spiritual life, the opposite of a spiritual life that draws on God by implicit faith in God's promises. I'll be honest with you folks, there's been times in my life where I've really struggled and I've had to turn back to God and say, you know what, Lord, uh, I'm having a hard time with this. I'm having a hard time understanding. I'm having a hard time here, God. And you know, I think our God, He knows us. He knows what we're thinking. He knows our heart anyway. And when we relate to Him and we say, Lord, I need you to touch my life. I need to see evidence of you here. I'm struggling. I believe our God is compassionate enough to beat us in our need. You know, I can get all hard and legal and say, oh, His grace is sufficient for you, but I really believe that the Jesus that I know of, when He went to Lazarus' grave, and he saw them crying and mourning and grieving. It says that he wept. It wasn't because he was unable to do something about the situation. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus. But our Jesus doesn't distance himself from the suffering of his people. That's a savior I can get behind. Anybody else ever been through struggles and trials that they've had to turn to Jesus? I know I have. Let's look at Peter's comment for a second. If you remember Matthew 22 to 36, the narrative relating Jesus sending his disciples across the lake, right? So many read this and fail to consider that Jesus knew there was going to be a storm. This is God. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He knows that a storm is going to come, and yet he sent his people across the lake. The implications of that can be staggering for some. In your life, Jesus knows you're going to come upon storms too. Consider with me, is it possible that Jesus wanted to test their commitment and their faith? I mean, I, who can say for another person, but it looks like that to me. The Synoptic Gospels give us a great picture of what happened here. John 6.19 tells us that the boat was over three miles from shore. Mark 6.48 tells us Jesus could see his disciples from where he sat praying on the mountain. The wind was blowing, the boat was rocking, and they are committed to their struggle against the wind to get the boat to the other side. So what does Jesus do? Gets up, walks out on the water. In Matthew 14, 28 and 29, we read, Lord, is it you? Peter asked. If it is, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Now I want to make a couple of points here before moving on. Peter waited for Jesus to tell him to come so that he was in the will of God. Second, why was Peter the only one who asked to come to Jesus? The boat's got a boatload of disciples here. Why is Peter the only one who wants to do the water walk? Hmm. See, if we're truly committed, we need to ask Jesus to use us and to seek opportunity to engage our faith. The third thing is that Peter miraculously walked on the water and while he was committed to keeping his eyes on Jesus, things were great. But when he let the circumstances around him distract him, when he started to notice the storm, when he got his eyes off of Jesus, that's when he began to sink. 
I would assert this morning that we need to be faithfully committed to Jesus and not allow the world even the smallest anchor within us. And friends, I'm preaching to you from experience here. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. When we try to do things in our own strength, we fail. In closing, I want to illustrate a couple of things. There was a man who wanted to sell his house in Haiti for $2,000. Another man wanted very badly to buy it. But because he was poor, he couldn't afford the full price. After much bargaining, the owner agreed to sell the house for half of the original price, with just one stipulation. He would retain ownership of one small nail protruding from just over the door. So he's giving him a house, not for $2,000, but for $1,000, on the condition that he can have this one nail that sits above the door. Sounds like a pretty good deal to me, doesn't it? Yeah. But we just read, we don't want to give the enemy even a small stronghold capture in our life, anything that he can use. After several years, the original owner wanted the house back, but the new owner was unwilling to sell. So the first owner went out, found the carcass of a dead dog, and he hung it from the single nail he still owned. Soon the house became unlivable and the family was forced to sell the house to the owner of the nail. The Haitian pastor concluded, if we leave the devil even one small peg in our life, he will hang his rotting garbage on it, making it unfit for Christ's habitation. And this is a quote from Dale A. Hayes for anybody that, uh, that reads that work. This morning... As we close in prayer, I want us to reaffirm with our Savior our commitment to his kingdom. Your Heavenly Father doesn't just want weekend visits. He wants full custody, folks. He loves you. He has told us he will never leave us or forsake us. We've looked at a number of illustrations here today. We've seen some examples where uh, people will still go through struggles in their life. And I am one that believes that we still go through trials and struggles. I've experienced it, and sometimes we can get low, and sometimes when we find our strength waning, actually all the time when we find our strength waning, and even before that, we need to turn to Jesus. And say, Lord, this is getting too much for me. Lord, I need your strength. I need your help. Lord, comfort my heart. Wrap me up in the cords of your love. Whatever it is that we are in need of, we need to go to the Lord in prayer. We need to ask him and say, God, I am, I am hurting. And if we as Christians that love the Lord God can get to those places, how much more can those people out there who have no hope get to them? We need to bring them the good news of Jesus. We need to let them know that there is one who loves them closer than a brother, that will never leave them or forsake them, that just thinks that they are wonderful. It's a place. It's an anchor. And my friends, that anchor for us is this church right here. This is, and I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about the fellowship of each other. As we interconnect with each other, we gain strength because Jesus shines in each and every one of us. I once saw this illustration of, uh, it was four Christians carrying a large log, and they all had it up on their shoulders, okay? And they walked out, and there was a large gap, uh, uh, like a ravine that they couldn't get across, and I guess it was about six feet across, and they had this, the thing like this, and as they're walking along, the guy in the front's holding the log, and everything falls out from underneath him. But the other three are still holding him in the log. And then his feet hit the other side and the next guy hits that. And the other three are supporting him. And then the next guy hits that trouble. And they're supporting him and so on. And their strength together allows them to overcome those difficulties and those trials and those struggles. And that's what we need is that fellowship. It is why the word of God says, forsake not the gathering together of the assembly as the manner of some is. We need it. And the people that are struggling that don't know Jesus need it. 
And so, yes, go ahead. Um, Salvation Army yes. has Bibles. Okay. And you can take them and give them to whoever you would like. That's perfect. Yeah. That's amazing. It's awesome. Another thing I like to do at Christmas time. Yeah, yeah, Gideon's probably. Yeah. One, one of the things I really like is um, at Christmas time where we can get like uh, bars of soap or, or, or deodorant or shaving cream or personal effects or even a bar of chocolate or something and throw them in wool socks and hand them out to the homeless on the street. Wonderful things like this. You know, we can get that hardened attitude, oh, they're just going to use this and sell it and buy it or whatever. But you know what? The honest truth is, is it's not our call to judge. It's our call to love. And if we can bring... God's love to the people to bring them some hope, then we are fulfilling our commitment to Christ. When we just stand back and we ignore it, what is our light doing? It's not shining. And so there's a number of points I've covered today. Um, the primary one is about being committed to Christ. Secondary one is about evangelizing and reaching out to the people that really really need to hear his good word. And the third point is, is that if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes as Christians, we make the mistake of trying to do things on our own. And we need to, when we get into those pits of despair or those points of darkness, we need to turn to Jesus and say, Lord, help me. Because he doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. He stands ready. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to get together today in the service. We thank you for the opportunity to look at all of the areas of commitment, well, not all, but some of the areas of commitment that you would share with your body today. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, that you want committed people, that you desire to have a relationship with us. I thank you, Jesus, that you, know, that you put in my heart the desire to reach, to seek, and to save the lost. You came to save the sinners, O oh God, and so I just pray, Lord, that that burden, that that heart goes to every person hearing this message today, that we will reach out. Lord, that we will send text messages to invite people to service. Lord, that we will um, you know, get an opportunity when we have an opportunity to invite them. When we get videos of God or stuff like that, that we will share them to our friends. When we have the opportunity to just spread who you are, right, and to shed the opportunity too, Lord, that when we have a church that can minister to those needs right here and right now in Canada, in our own country, right here, right now where we need that, that those opportunities are available. I just pray, God, that the eyes will open, Lord, and that we will reach out to our communities and we will embrace our communities in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that as we go from this place, God, that you'll keep us all in safeguard. I ask, God, for those that are not here today, Lord, that you will bless them, that you will keep them safe. I pray, Lord, that the ravages of COVID-19 will not touch your saints. Lord, I pray, Jesus, that you will bless them, that you will lead them and guide them in the way that they should go. I pray, Lord Jesus, this morning, God, that for anyone that needs prayer, Lord, that they will contact us, God, that they will contact us, Jesus, that that uh, we can pray with them and for them. And I thank you for it, Jesus, in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Now this sermon today is broadcast live from Crossroads um, Christian Fellowship in Selmo. The address, if you want to have prayer or contact me, is rayofhope.livestream at outlook.com. I look forward to hearing from you really soon. God bless.